Hey, Rock and Roll Nation. Thank you so much for tuning in to the very first episode of Rock and Roll Denim's Talk and Shoot podcast. We've got a rank first episode for you guys today. We'll have two of the greatest bull riders of all time in studio. That's right. Tough Hedeman and Dale Brisby stop by to catch up with us. And I don't think we could have asked for a better way to kick off the podcast. Today's show is brought to you by our Vintage 46 Collection, a modern fit for the classic cowboy look. And to all of those in the North Texas area, don't miss out on our fourth annual NRS and Rock and Roll Denim's Back to School Roundup. Saturday, August 7th out at NRS in Decatur, Texas, bring out the whole family for fun times, great food, and appearances by today's guests, Tuff Hedeman and Dale Brisby. The action kicks off at noon and goes till 5 p.m. And on that note, without further ado, this is Talk and Shoot. Welcome to the very first podcast we're going to do is Rock and Roll Denim. Uh, we've named, we've workshopped a couple names so far, but I think we were going to wait until we have all that completely locked down to go ahead and put it on the screen and stuff like that. But, uh, they had a couple ideas, uh, talk and shoot was the number one, but I could have swore I stole that from you. No, I don't remember ever saying anything like that. You got shit and get from him. There you go. I, okay. That's yeah. it. That's the name of the podcast. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. What do you think Tuff? What should the name be? Um, you stumped me. I, I'm not quite sure. Give me a minute. I'll come up with something very creative, innovative, I'll give it exciting. Plenty. Yeah. In the shoot. In with the shoot. Who, whoever, whoever's going to be the host. Are you going to be the main host? I'm the main host. You're the main host. I'm In the, the shoot host. with JD. In the shoot with JD. In the shoot with Rock and Roll Denim. But, I mean, everybody uses that. In the barrel, behind the shoot. Right. Kicking so. ass with JD. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name. That's it. <laughs> But I like it. Yeah. So you're the man, huh? You're going to be leading the leading the charge on all these. That's it, man. I mean, when I first went to college, like the idea was to be a sports broadcaster. So I wanted to be the one on the sidelines for NFL. Mainly, I wanted to do NBA. But uh, that was the idea when I went to journalism school was to be the guy that was doing a little bit of color on the sidelines. Next so, best thing is rodeo. Telling you what? Better. Thing. I'd say better for sure. There are so many different instances why I will tell you why rodeo is the better sport to cover. And first and foremost, it's the people. You know, anytime I need tough, anytime I need you, you guys are right there. This second that we ask you to, like you're you're always so generous with your time. A lot of those other NFL and NBA guys, you don't really get that type of, type of action from them. You know, you got to work for a little bit more. I will say that you guys are starting off with a bang with two of the greatest bull riders of all time. I don't know how this could have gotten any better. I've been, I almost lost sleep. I was so excited about this last night. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I mean, clearly tough. We've been, we've been, you know, friends for over a year now, and he's he's always. Been best friends, I might add. Best friends. <laughs> Do you hear that, Dale Brisby? <laughs> best friends. Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody with a... Duh. With your... <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take it. Um, but no, I'm very excited to have both of you guys on for our very first inaugural podcast. Of course, we've, you know, we've been partners with you guys for a long time, and uh, you know, y'all have always delivered us great content, and now we get to actually sit and talk about it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Is... Tough, I'm sure. Are you the the longest standing endorsee that Panhandle has? I would, uh, I would, I would say yes. <laughs> I was, I, I think I was the, the first endorsee they ever had. What what uh, year was that? Well, I, I first started wearing their product and kind of hanging out around here a little bit and in '86, and then the first ad shoot that we did was like '89, and that was a uh, the one that. Uh, we did with Lane Frost, and that was, that was eighty nine, and then eighty six. Was that the that was your first world title? Yes, it was a, it was a very soft year. So, <laughs> so, uh, so they they happened to sign you before you won the world. Well, they didn't really sign me. They gave me some free shirts, and and I just kept coming back and. Got to, got to be good friends with, uh, you know, the owners and uh, a guy that was a VP at that time, and I haven't left. I haven't left since. So yes, I'm sir. sure. I'm sure they're looking for a good reason to <laughs> send me to the exit door, but I, I keep dodging that. That couldn't be further from the truth. Just to put on record, yeah. no way. <laughs> we have to have tough. <laughs> but uh, no, they, they're a remarkable company. Remarkable family and an ownership that uh in this day and age you just don't see this kind of company any, anywhere else you just don't what was it like how different was it 
around that time as far as like how endorsements work or, or sponsorships like it seems like these days you see a lot of guys with a ton of patches on their shirts but has it has it always been pretty much the same like that or was it a little different back no then? well there, there was really no patches until the you know early or mid 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 90s you know just the fact that you know I, I always wore their product and they were always appreciative of that and unfortunately with the the geniuses in in pro rodeo uh they were always restricted from doing advertising you know within the the prca and nfr uh but you know i always i always wore it but you couldn't display any kind of signage and i i think as of today you still can't which that's correct reinforces my belief that they're idiots <laughs> <laughs> we we definitely still have some issues with trying to get branding in there. No, it's, it's it just it makes zero sense. You know they 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 treat you like you're an employee and you're not. You know you're an independent contractor. So we're not going to pay you for anything, but you can't get paid to work for somebody else, which is complete nonsense and happens in no other sport in the world besides rodeo. Yep, I forgot about that little rule in there but it seems like there there's there's some people trying to make it different you know kind of make it to where i mean there's there's been resistance but yeah it's well there's a well there's a way there's always you know we were always fairly creative and being able to, to be be seen and heard with whatever product or company that that we represented so you know the more companies and the more involvement you get you know that's that's really how you grow a sport you know one company isn't going to spend you know even if they have the resources they're not going to spend the kind of money it takes to really grow a sport and grow a business like you know i think i think nascar was the easiest sport to follow where they let you know everything had a had a had a price in terms of advertising you know they they sold one t title sponsorship for this series and other than that, you know, when you would see, you know, they had Ford, Chevy, uh, you know, Dodge, you know, so they let all the competitors compete for advertising and, you know, for rodeo and, and bull riding not to do that just seems pretty foolish to me. You just, you know, a lot of money just goes away that people want to get involved and, you know, want to advertise and, and grow the sport. Uh, but for some reason, there's some people that make decisions that I just respectfully don't agree with. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, that's never really made sense to me either. I mean, if you, I mean, you said NASCAR. If you look at the NASCAR model, every single car has got what 150 brands on it. A bunch. A bunch. Like, what's? Why wouldn't you think that, or why wouldn't anybody think that that'd be beneficial to the to the rodeo community and to the rider itself? Well, they're all, they're always fearful that oh well if you let my competitor advertise, then I'm not going to advertise with you, which is it's not a very valid argument because their biggest fear is that you're going to be there and they're not. Right. You know, and so their way to lock every, lock someone out was that they sell a company an exclusive, which it sounds good, but uh, you just never generate the kind of income that you, that you really need, again, to, to grow the sport in every way, not just from – you know, the contestants, but, you know, just your fan base and, you know, NASCAR was built by companies all around the country that just wanted to be involved. And so that all of a sudden it just exploded. You had all these millions and millions of dollars from, from everyone, you know, they could buy a driver, they could, you know, they could advertise with the track they could advertise you know various ways again growing the sport but uh that that mindset never but well, it seems as though you know if you believe in capitalism that competition is always healthy even if it's among the sponsors right you know well, it yes. seems as though that you know if somebody was competing for a spot they'd want to pay more which would inevitably mean more money in the cowboy's pocket which you know, I think today 
being on social media, there's a lot of people out there that are interested in this sport. There's a lot of new fans to this sport because of the internet that, that I think, um, and, and that's a good thing. But one thing that a lot of kids and young people are, are wondering is, is about just the earning potential. You know, they want to make a living rodeoing. Can you speak to, to what that's like? today and what you've learned in your career as far as like if, if you want to do this as a profession kind well of- the, the the challenge is depends in, it, it depends on what event you participate in you know if you're a rough stock guy um you know you don't have the expense of a timed event guy so it's it's a little bit i would say it's it's, it's easier because it doesn't take as much money to to pay your expenses I mean, if you're a timed event guy, if you're a team roper or a calf roper, you've got a horse, trucks, trailers, you got all this expense. And if you're a bull rider, you got thousand dollars worth of equipment and your ass, and that's it. You know, to be a professional calf roper, you got to have probably a quarter of a million dollars before the, you the, the, the first day. The first day you start, right? Truck, trailer, horse, everything. That's before you fill up you know, with fuel one time. So <laughs> it's a, to be a timed eventer in, in professional rodeo is a huge challenge. And, you know, the better you are, you know, the more you're going to win and the more sponsorship you're going to attract. You know, sponsors, it's it's kind of like, sponsors kind of like bankers, you know. Bankers love you when you got plenty of money. They want to lend you money. But when you need money, they won't lend you shit. Okay, so when you really need a sponsor, chances are you probably haven't been haven't won enough, or maybe haven't has haven't been around enough to to be seen. But you really need the sponsorship money to to get on the road and go try to be competitive. And a sponsor, well, who are you? We never heard of you. They're not all that interested. You know, they're interested if you go win Cheyenne or you go win Calgary, well then you, you don't need them quite as much. You always want you always want to have sponsorship and support, but you don't need them quite as much when you're winning, and so they're they're easier to come by. But that's just the, the nature of the yeah. You have a little more leverage, uh, right? If they know who you are, <laughs> that's yeah. you, got, you got a better chance, right? A lot of leverage there, for sure. Yeah, I would think that. You know, I think essentially if you can find a way to make money different ways by doing the same thing, you know, so if you're if you're making essentially the two best ways in rodeo, it's like you're riding bulls, you know, you win money and then you have sponsors. And so th- those are, that's you're doing one thing, but you make money two different ways. And if you can find a third way, which may be like you're selling your own product. Yeah, if you have, you know, and, and that's that, that's just evolved. You know, as all sports have evolved, you know, forever. You know, I rode up professionally for 15 years, but, you know, I never really had any sp- sponsorship to speak of. And really maybe until just the last few years I was competing. I mean, and so... It was all just based on what what you won, you know. I think I won, I won the world probably three times before I ever really got paid any kind of money to do something. You know, prior to that, usually it was product and and things of that sort. So now everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to be this and that, and I want to sponsor. Well, I, I think most most people don't even understand what that means. They most people. Or a lot of people look at it. Well, I'm really good, and so you're going to pay me some money because I'm really good, right? You know, sponsorship is a job and responsibility to a company. Absolutely, they're paying you, they're hiring you to represent them, and you know, give their product or services some sort of positive impact that hopefully sell more product or sales, right? And so. So few people even understand what that is. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as they get paid, they think, hey, I'm good to go. They forget, well, we want you to go make an appearance here. We want you to show up to for a photo shoot here. We want to do this. We want to do that. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm kind of busy. Well, 
you got paid, you know, so they, they expect something in return. So it's, it, 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 it's a job. It's a, it's another responsibility. And when you're rodeoing, it, it, it's a little difficult to balance every now and then, but you know, for, for me it wasn't because I knew how hard they were to come by. So at the end of the day, Panhandle Western wear gave you clothes and money because they wanted to sell more shirts. Hopefully. Right. And we did just, and you did. Right? And that's why he's still, you know, an indoor C 35 years later. Right. That, obviously. I mean, the Tufts is family, man. Anytime that you, anytime that I'm with the owners and anytime that we know that Tufts coming in or we're having a lunch or something like that, it's like, you know, Tufts family, we're going to take care of him. And on the same coin of that too, Tuff made this joke the last time that we had lunch with the owners and everything. It's like, you guys tell me to come wash the toilets. I'd be there in a minute. He right. literally would do anything for us. Well, and, and I think with Tuff and as you know, you would hope a lot of those relationships turn, you know, they're, they turn into more than a transaction. Yes, sir. For sure. Know? And for that's, sure. that's one thing I think might be, I'm not going to say it doesn't exist in other industries, but in the rodeo industry, you know, typically, you know, your word and, and a friendship type situation can sometimes be a little easier to come by, I would think in this industry. Well, I, I, I just think at the end of the day, the only thing that you really have is your word. And if your word isn't any good, what have you, what have you got? And so I've always treated all the sponsor relationships that I have, uh, you know, it's, it's always very important to me because they, you know, felt like that I brought something and so you know I've been with these guys forever I was with Anheuser-Busch for 13 years and nobody is ever with those guys that long there's only was only one other guy in the history of their sports marketing that had a longer tenure than that so all the all the you know I, the sponsorships that I've ever had you know I, I still have the majority of them, you know, a couple, few companies that went by the wayside, but, uh, you know, other than that, I've been, I've been with the same bunch and it wasn't, you know, there's been times I could have went other places for certain, certain, certain brands for, you know, maybe, maybe more money, but I, I've never looked at it like I was chasing a, a dollar, like, you know, another zero at the end end of my account wasn't going to make my life that much better so i figured these guys have always treated me with respect i always say they treat me like family except they treat me a hell of a lot better than my family <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh you know i'm always just grateful and appreciative that uh they've been so good to me for so long and then there's i think at times a lot of times they're like in my mind like they could they could they could kick me out the door today and never miss a beat without me so i i know that uh so that makes me appreciate it that much more no shot i got to keep you around tough i know i've got a couple questions but you're the man i t the thing is is like since y'all been talking it's like oh question here question here pop up question <laughs> don't forget that question here um <clears throat> couple things though uh <clears throat> Do you remember, like, as far as social media goes now with, like, photo shoots, I think we have an endorsee shoot almost every quarter, something that we're doing like that. Back then with sponsorships, was there a lot of media planned to where you would have to go to location and do shoots with companies that would sponsor you? I didn't have to do that many shoots, but I did a, a lot of appearances. Yeah. But, you know, every every company I dealt with had different programs and different philosophies, so... You know, with with Panhandle, it was it would it would it would just vary. You know, but I and with Panhandle for for years and years, I went to every sales meeting. I went to you know pretty much every sales dinner. As far as ad shoots, just whenever whenever they decided they did, would do it. When I was at Anheuser Busch, you know, contractually, it would, it would say you know you're obligated to ten. 10 appearances, personal appearances, and, you know, one photo shoot a year and then go to their national convention every year. Yes, sir. And, you know, different companies just have different, you know, different philosophies and different ad campaigns. And 
you know, some I I've, I've been with companies that that they that they paid me but they didn't do a heck of a lot with me, but that's fine with me cuz nobody does nothing better than me. That's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Now that you're you're kind of on the other coin of it or the other side, you know, I know you did PBR for a long time and now we have the Tough Heatman tour. And Tough Heatman tour is the thing that I've been personally involved in a little bit of, as far as going out and getting media and stuff like that. When we're talking about, you know, PRCA versus other independent companies that put on a show like you do, where do you stand as far as like letting people wear patches in the arena? Well, if, as long as it's nothing in in very poor taste, that's 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 not really none of my business. Who the writer who who is their 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 sponsor? It doesn't matter if it competes with my sponsor as you know whether it's a whether it's a you know a Western Wear label or a or or a car dealer or an adult beverage, you know, whatever, you know, I, the, the freedom of, I mean, I don't, I don't pay the guys unless they, they get paid if they win, you know, they're, they're all independent contractors in my mind. And it's, quite honestly, it's none of my business. What, who, who they work for. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, I just, and then that's, that's how, that's how it should be. It's that's when, when we formed the PBR, that's, that's how it was. And, I think they've become more and more restrictive because of the pressure that that they receive from from their you know, from the organization sponsors, which again it's two different things. And right, you know, companies. I don't I don't blame them for asking for you know exclusivity and whatnot. I don't blame them for asking. I blame the organization for giving it to them because it's bullshit. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah, that's a good way to. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, you can understand why the company that gets it would want it. But right. Yeah. If you get, to, yeah. If I if I could lock out, right. if I if I could have locked out all the guys that I knew I couldn't beat, sometimes <laughs> if I could if I could have locked out Jim Sharp and Lane Frost and Clint Bronger, right. I'd, I'd be a fifteen time world champion. <laughs> you know, yeah. but you know that's that's in reality that's what it is. Yes, sir. Well, that's what makes me scratch my head about PRCA is like, why wouldn't you allow these people to make the most amount of money that they possibly can representing your sport? Yeah. You know, to let them be independent on their own and to make a living and to represent rodeo in a positive way, especially in this day and age where there are cameras everywhere. It's pretty, yeah, it, it makes no sense. It's, I guess it's like the people that say, you don't, you don't really need an ID to vote. <laughs> it's the same it's the same i mean what what part of that makes sense right you have to have idea to do everything in this world right <laughs> to go get on an airplane to go do anything you have to show a form of identification right. and you've got idiots who say you shouldn't have to have an id to vote yeah i don't know about all that how, how stupid can you get yeah that's what um <laughs> just saying yeah no that's true 100 percent. i mean it's just so you know I, I just think at times the world has lost <clears throat> common sense and respect and decency and i just don't understand that i think what i have to agree <laughs> in a lot of ways for sure one thing you know that one thing that a lot of people say is like i was talking to somebody about it just before we got started more in the ranching and side of our industry rather than the rodeo but you know it's a lot of people that think the cowboy way of life is dying and but what i see from the internet is a lot of new interest you know and i already mentioned it once but essentially like kids and and grown-ups even just flooding to this space because they're they maybe they're just now learning about it you know chris ledoux had that song you just can't see them from the road. And now thanks to the internet, you can see a lot of us from the road. And so I've got a lot of kids like, how do I get started rodeoing? How do I get started ranching? What's it going to cost for me to buy my first horse? Odds are most of these people that are messaging me are not going to become career bull riders, lifetime cowboys. But what I see is that a lot of them may experience it a little bit, and go back to whatever lifestyle they were going to have originally, but now they're a fan. 
Right. Now they're Yeah, they they've got an interest because it's it, it's unique, it's different and you know, I always say if I can get somebody to come to one of my bull riding events, I don't care where you're from, what you do, how much money you make. Uh you'll have fun. Yes. You don't have to know anything about Exactly. bull riding. You don't have to have a cowboy hat on. Yes. You don't have to understand anything. It's a very simple sport. We try to present it as just fun and entertainment while giving the guys that are riding a great competitive opportunity to to win some extra cash and it's 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 that simple and you know the events that I do are they're pretty they're pretty fast paced and it's a lot of action and you know I think people go to events you know whether it's a movie a concert or rodeo bull riding sporting event to kind of get away from the world for a few hours and just have a good time and that's that's always kind of been my goal understanding that it's my job to entertain the people that bu- spend their hard-earned money to buy a ticket because if it's not for them you're out of business yes, sir so what what i tell a lot of those kids that ask me how do i get started for instance, riding bulls, you know, I would tell them to, to find a school, you know, Always. a lot of schools. And you can find out going to a school, you can get the, the basics, nuts and bolts of get an idea of what it takes to be a bull rider, how to approach it. And, you know, that's by far and away the best, you know, you don't just show up and say, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get on because it's beyond dangerous you know even for the good get even for the good guys and so it's 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 pretty cool that you have guys that you know put on clinics and schools that can let these guys experience it and I always say bull riding it's it's always a great idea until you're the one that has to do it <laughs> and so <laughs> what? whenever you whenever you get on they're banging your knees off the steel chutes and you're like this was like a really good idea when I tell my buddies I was going to be a bull rider. But it's, uh, for me, it's the coolest thing in the world, but it's not for a lot of people. What What were those first, what was it like for you starting out? Well, I started riding calves when I was uh, four years old. So the first calf I got on, he just took off running straight and, I I stayed on the whole way. I thought, as soon as they let him go, I think I was screaming and crying. And then as soon as they got off, I'm like, wow, that's cool. It's, And that, that was the same feeling on the first one when I was four and the last bull I got on when I was 35. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a rush of adrenaline. It's just a feeling of excitement that you can't really compare it to anything else. For for me, the only thing I can compare it to is I got to fly an F-16 with the Thunderbirds one time, and I had to stick for about 15 minutes. And <laughs> You want to talk about cool shit. <laughs> there, there's nothing I've ever done that, I mean, yeah. to be going in as fast as the speed of sound. So when I started riding calves, then, you know, I was hooked instantly because there's that, you know, when you when you start to get on, you're like, you get a little, get get nervous, and but when you start that young, you don't realize what 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 can really happen. So I just I came up to junior and high school rodeos, and I think I, I made the whistle on my first calf. I don't think I made the whistle again until I was like ten or twelve. Because <laughs> I, I mean I just sucked. I was pretty clumsy I wouldn't be coordinated and so but I I mean I liked it I, I just loved it but I was I was terrible and I mean people even look oh well you're too you're too tall you're too this you're too that and I'm like I was thinking to myself no I'm just no I just suck I have to get better so <laughs> I would just get on more I just get on just get on get on get on get drilled and get on, get drilled, get on, get drilled. And so finally when I was in high school, probably first or second year in high school, I, I got to where I could 
I could got to where I could make the whistle a little bit, and that was about the same time I started. I grew up around horse racing. I started working at the track when I was eight, and when I was like 15, I started breaking racehorses and galloping racehorses. And when I started doing that, I think where was that? That was uh, in El Paso, El Texas. Paso. El Paso and El Paso in the winter and Rios in the summer. Yes, sir. And so once I started doing that, I think you know physically my my, my body got in a little better shape and just the balance that it takes to you know when you're when you're on a racehorse, the the saddle that you're on is there's not much of a saddle at all. You know, you, you've got stirrups and basically a, a little uh, leather pad that you sit on, but it's all balance. And once I started exercising horses, then my, my bull riding kind of really took a turn for the for, for the better. But it was just getting on lots and lots and lots and lots of bulls. So you feel like it was a larger percentage of hard work rather than just natural talent? That oh, I, well, I had no natural talent. Like, maybe zero or possibly less than zero. <laughs> when you were <laughs> practicing... Like no, I mean, you can... you can. I mean, <laughs> but but whenever, even when I went to college, that's when I started, we would go get on bulls and I would go get on... I would get on till I, I thought I couldn't, you know, I was too tired to get on anymore, but I'd get on... <clears throat> Five, six, seven, eight, nine in a day. What do you think? And, and, the and, 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 and the guys that were guys that could ride, they'd get on one or two. And some some of the guys that could really ride, they didn't get on any. They didn't need to practice, and that was fine. But for, but for me, I knew the only way I was going to get any better was to get on. What, what do you think's the most you got on in one day? Mm, I probably got on probably eleven or twelve, maybe one time. Twelve bulls in a day. Was there a point in your career where you got on less practice bulls? Um, well, when I started, you know, when I went to college, I started riding professionally. I would always go to enough rodeos to yes, sir. feel like. Uh, but even, you know, the first few years I went to the national finals, we would, I would, I would go get on some bulls. I mean, I remember me and Lane Frost going up to Dylan Page's, you know, in the mid '80s, and getting on, getting on bulls before we went to the NFR because we would rodeoed all year long, and October and November kind of slow, so you weren't getting on as much. When January th through the first of September, we would, you know, the first ten years I rodeoed, I'd go to about a hundred to one hundred and twenty-five rodeos a year. So I was getting on lots of bulls, and so. You, then you get to the last two months of the year and you're not getting on as many. I always felt like to stay to stay sharp, we'd, we'd go get on some good ones. I feel like talking about going to that many rodeos, I'm curious what your um, opinion is about, you know, the, the, the limit, the rule where, you know, you can only count so many. Well, I, I, th I think at the end of the day, they should count whatever you whatever you go to, <clears throat> but you know, back in the you know the early '80s, you know when Donnie Gay was winning his world championships, you know, he he had an airplane. He'd go to 250 rodeos when other guys was going to 70 or 80. That's crazy. Yes, sir. But uh, um, you know, there's more times than not, you know, whoever whoever wins a world championship. In any given year, is a guy that is just better than everybody else. It doesn't matter. You know, I always find it funny you hear people, well, the judges don't like me this, that, or the other. And it's, if you really look at it, that's pretty much nonsense. A guy that I remember watching a show here not that long ago, and the guy said, well, he would be a world champion if he wasn't this or that. But his riding percentage is less than 30%. <laughs> Sage Kimsey, riding percentage is 72%. JB, you know, when he's winning the championship is because he made the whistle more than everybody else. Yes, yeah, sir. And that's ultimately who wins. So 
this, you know, you might disagree with a score a particular day. You might disagree with them every day. I mean, it's a subjective event. But especially now, if if you don't win, you're not competitive now because of the caliber and quality of the bulls. It's just because you're not you're not as good as you should be. Um, I will I will say. I mean, the bulls are much better now than they were when when I when I was riding. Much better. I mean, the good one, the world champion bull in '85 was as good as the world champion bull this year. But now they're all good. Yes. Back then they weren't, so you could, you could go to, you know, you go, it, it would go on streaks. You could go for three, four weeks and just draw bulls that, no matter how good you rode, you weren't going to win because they were just duds. And so, now with all the, the breeding programs and, the number of people involved in, it, there's great bulls everywhere. Yes, yeah, sir. And so, so there may have only been like one or two of those bulls in each pen. Yeah, d- d- and you knew who they were. You know, you, different, different, different regions. You know, Texas were always known for having really good bulls. You know, you go to the Midwest; their bulls were always pretty subpar. <clears throat> you know, the bulls never were great in Canada until you know the last fifteen, twenty years. But you know, again, doesn't matter how good. It's like a jockey taking a jockey to the Kentucky Derby and put him on a slow horse. No matter how good you ride, you're still not going to be competitive bull riding half the scores of the bulls. So um, it was it was it was a good thing you could blame it on. <laughs> you know, when if you're if you're an excuse guy, well, I I drew I drew a bad one. He was no good. Well, no, that was the case a lot of times back then. Now that's not the case because. You might not get the bull that you want right now, but if if you ride bulls at the highest level right now, the bulls are outstanding. And the guys who win, the guys who win championships are guys that just stay on more than other guys. And that's what I liked about bull riding because it didn't matter what your name was, who your parents were, what color you were, where you come from. If you If you make the whistle – more than anybody else, you're gonna win. You know, and I, and I always and always it, it annoys me still. People always talk about the judge, and you know, it's 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 irrelevant. Yeah, I don't agree with them a lot of times either, but that's just on a particular day. But but at the end of the year, the guy that wins is the guy that rides better than everybody else. That's crazy. I mean, with bull riding being so subjective, it's for me coming into the rodeo sport, like around sports for a while and did rodeo when I was a kid very very young but to come back in and to try to be a fan of bull riding there was a lot of nuance about the bull versus the rider that I had to learn just to be a spectator and you know you see your top guys like the guys that I see now that are mainstays in my head as far as bull riding they are the guys that you're talking about that just stay on yeah I mean those good years yeah it's it's funny because Everybody's, you know, everybody's always saying, well, who's the greatest of this, that, and the other? And, you know, it's nothing more than an opinion because, you know, there are different eras, different generations, what, whatever. But to me, the best guy I've, I've ever seen was Jim Sharp. And uh, he never he never looked at the judges' see sheets or, you know, he'd go see if he won anything. And if he won, he was fine. If he didn't. He just go to the next one. He 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 just had the best attitude. I guess it's easy to have the best attitude when you're better than everybody else because he <laughs> he could just ride anything and everything. And back then, the national finals was the the highest level of where just you had the top guys and all the top bulls, and nobody had ever ridden ten in a row at the national finals until Jim Sharp came along and over the course of three years uh i think it was from 90 or from let's see 80 probably seven through 89 he rode 23 in a row nobody had ever ridden 10 so that's wow. that's that's how i that's my fact of why i i think he's the best guy i've ever that's seen. crazy 
Wow. And people say, you don't think you were as good as him? I said, no, I know I wasn't as good as he was. Uh, I was talking to some guys a few days ago about just kind of your your shoot procedure and your mindset leading up to that point when you nod and even during the ride. What uh, Can you talk about like what you would teach a young guy and what it would take to be that consistent? Well, I think you, you, you get into a routine of how you do things, but I think the, the, the main thing is to make sure your, your hand's in the right spot. Um, and I always try to spend as less time in the shoot as possible and just make sure that the bull's in a position where he can leave cleanly, you know, where he's not looking out the back or, you know, it never bothered me if one is leaning a little bit one way or another. Some people think that they have to stand like a statue for him to nod, which I think is just really doesn't doesn't matter because as soon as the gate opens, all hell breaks loose, and you know it doesn't really matter how how he was standing. If 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 one's like squatting down or leaning, you can just picture yourself like like if you're in this chair and you're leaning against the side before you can ever get up and walk off you have to you have to sit up straight and then walk off and that's that's what a bull does when you open the chute if he's leaning first thing you do is he stands up and then he turns and goes because he can't mm -hmm. he can't take he can't take a jump from leaning or not standing having all his weight equally distributed without you know, again, sound like a statue. I think I think a lot of guys, in my mind, just take too long. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like I would have to do what you do, and I couldn't spend that much time in the shoot because I started to get in my head a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, it just becomes kind of a habit, and how you were, how you were taught, and how you, you know, how, you know, I, I didn't like getting screamed at by the contractor or whoever's running the shoot, so I'd just be ready and. There was, there was one contractor, he was, he's from Montana, his name was Reg Kessler, and he was a, he was a known character, like, just screaming and cussing at you, and, like, uh, and so the first time I ever went to one of his rodeos, they had one of his bulls that had been to the NFR, and he was real bad in the shoot, he fought the shoot, they had time in, and, but I knew that he was, like, would be screaming and throwing a fit, and so I just, I pulled my rope and I just, I, when he came walking up to my chute to tell me to get ready or whatever, I was already ready. And I told him, I said, Mr. Kessler, I said, I'm ready. So whenever you get ready, you just open the chute. I'm ready whenever you are. And so <laughs> from that point in time, he was never any, he was always super, super nice to me. He never, he cussed at everybody, but he never did cuss at me. Just because, of, just because of that, you got his respect right there. Or don't. Isn't but that, that was that was just kind of an old school thing. Yes, sir. And the contractors are very proud of what they do, and you know their stock back there, right? Like their character in themselves on the shoots, right? I think in my time it was, you know, Benny Butler was really Uncle, Uncle Benny. Some people called sure. him, but he was a little bit more the the hard ass of the yeah the group well, that. <clears throat> And he, he was the same thing with him. I, I always got along with him because he knew that, you know, we would come get on in the slack. And I remember we were at Enid, Oklahoma one time, I think, or Altus somewhere. It was raining straight down. Like, it couldn't have been raining any harder. And all these guys were turning out, not getting on and whatever. And we all, we all got on. And, it, again, it was straight down mud water it was, it was it was a mess but those, those kind of guys if they if they thought you were a cowboy and they thought that you were gonna make best efforts to to get on and compete you know they 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 frowned upon you if you were if they thought you were a little soft or a little weak they would they would pounce on you in a minute but if they thought if they thought you were making best efforts and again they thought you tried hard they thought you were in their mind, being a, being a cowboy, then then they would do anything and everything to help you. But if not, 
it, it, would look, it looked like a miserable experience <laughs> for me. I like the rain because nobody else likes the rain. I, I'm the same way. I mean, you know, I walk out. Who cares? You know, you get muddy, you get wet, whatever. I could win just as good not not worrying about it. Because if you're worrying about getting wet, or, I mean, hell, you'll, you'll dry off sooner or later. If you get muddy, you can probably take a shower. And it's not that big a deal. But right. And you just notice so many people are so, like, cautious about it and then they wind up getting drilled yeah this is another thing to get in your head it's a temporary circumstance rain or mud yeah I always shower are you uh are you a fan of the nfr in vegas or do you like it in fort worth i'm not a fan of, i'm not a fan of the nfr anywhere i thought i thought it was i thought it was i thought texas did a great job last year in pretty much saving the day and actually pulling it off with not a lot of time to, to, to plan. So one of the few times I've ever really said the PRCA did a great job. I haven't said that very many times. I had that brand new building. But I think they, 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 they did a good job. I thought, I thought, you know, the production, I thought, I thought it was outstanding here. I, I think it'll always stay in Vegas because I think Vegas not that I wouldn't like to see it in Texas. I, it doesn't really matter. I just think it has more value to Vegas, and Vegas will do more to keep it than than Texas will. I could be wrong, but it's pretty nice not having to get on an airplane and fly all the way to Vegas. But I, I love Vegas, so. But e e e either way, but I think it'll stay in Vegas. Yeah, I enjoy going to Vegas for during the rodeo, for sure. Yeah. yeah. That was my first NFR experience. A lot of cowboy hats. There's a lot of cowboy hats. You remember last year, there was like an article, they were putting cowboy hats on the pigeons. Not last year, but the year before in Vegas. Yes. There's an article that there were people gluing hats to the pigeons. Yes, hilarious. That's what we need more of in this country. Just a little bit more. Pigeons wearing cowboy, cowboy hats. Cowboy hats, yeah. Right. Yeah. Something to liven it up. I think NFR this year is going to be crazy just for that return to Vegas type situation that they're going to have. Well... Another reason it's going to be crazy is because J.B. Mooney's going to be there. Oh, hold on to your seats, ladies and gentlemen. Have you been following a lot of his? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge J.B. fan. You guys have been buddies a long time. Long time, yeah. He's a, he's legit. You know, he, he's wanted to go to the NFR for a long time. And, uh, you know, now, now even, you know, in the whatever you want to call his career, Twilight or whatever, you know, he, everybody keeps telling him that he's that he's done, that he's that he's finished, and he keeps showing up and proving <laughs> that he's not. So, you know, you know, old chubby Phil won the big golf tournament, and Brady won the Super Bowl. I don't see why J. W. <laughs> Mooney can't go to Vegas and kick ass. So, yep. again, I'm a, I'm a huge J. B. fan, and he. He's uh, he's he just kind of the way he rides is is a little bit what I would think about myself, and that not always pretty, but he just more determination and effort and, and guts and than than raw talent. I did a podcast with him, and uh, that's what he said. He said we we were talking about we asked him number one who he would travel with. If he were rodeoing in the early '90s, and late '80s, and he said you and Razor, and then who he feels like his rides most emulate, and he said tough. <laughs> so well, he just you know you see him times when it looks like he's going to get bucked off, and, and he doesn't because most guys that get in that kind of a position they'll just give up, and there's no give up in him, and he's a uh, yeah. I'm pretty. I'm pretty excited about seeing him at the NFR, when and and you know, Sage Sage is kind of like, like Jim. He just does everything so correct that he makes it look easy and mm -hmm. even kind of kind of boring uh, because he just he does it fundamentally just so correct. just just like Jim. Just he'll make the, the baddest bull look very very common. Yes, sir. 
It's like Pete Gay said, you know, watching Jim Sharp ride bulls, nothing more boring than watching him ride bulls. <laughs> <laughs> And that's that's kind of kind of like Sage. It's like, and uh, so he'll ride a bull a year. He'll he'll ride, you know, whatever. Never been ridden. It's oh, well, he just didn't have his day. Right. Well, they they never have their day when you're just right in the middle and you're not here and there. And yeah, you know, I I never was able to to ride like that. But you know, it just it's a little different. It's a different style. But I would. If I got to pick one, I would pick their style because it, it looks quite a bit easier, you know. I think in the bareback riding, I see it would be um, Casey Fields, and in the bronc riding, I think right now is uh, rider right. As far as like they just ride so square and correct and fundamentally correct. They just, yeah, they just do everything and so sage in the board. So so correct that. It, they they just stand out as you know, I mean that's that's the way you, in the handbook that's the way you're supposed yes, to do it, and they just do everything. You know. Yep. There's actually a handbook. It's the judge. <laughs> you're referring to the judges' book, right? Oh, I don't. Think, I don't think the judges have a book, and even if they had one, they couldn't read it. <laughs> I, Most I, of them. <laughs> I thought in the back of that book, there's like there's twelve criteria they're supposed to watch, whether they do or not. Like you said, I don't know. That's well, just the like, list. I'm it's like for the horse and for the rider. Right. You go to like the judges' seminars. So like for the bareback riding, for instance, you know you might see some guys get wild or really like lean away from their hand. But that's what I mean when I say Casey Fields. You know, he's just right square in the middle of them, very correct, very symmetric. Right, and most bareback riders are a little more dominant with one leg or the other, and not as yeah. He the funny thing about Casey Field is like I'm not I'm not saying anything negative about him, but he, he to me doesn't look as good as he did you know the first five or six years because. And he's still the best guy, yeah. you know. Yeah, sure. But you know, the first four or five years he'd go to the NFR, he'd win at least five or six rounds. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't because his mother was judging; it's because he <laughs> just did everything correctly every time. Yeah. From an from an outsider fan of rodeo, I'm, I'm I'm getting there as far as like the nuance of judging and you know what you're looking for as far as a very talented rider, a very consistent rider. You know, the things that I notice more are character. I want to see the, what's the character of this rider. You know, when you talk about a J.B. Mooney, when I see J.B. ride and when I hear J.B. talk, I think Stone Cold Steve Austin from the WWF, straight up. Just no BS. I'm out there to do my job, and then I'm in the truck and hitting the next road. Well, I, next don't, I don't know a lot about wrestling, but like— I know too much I know about the, wrestling. As far as J.B., you know, when it comes time for those guys at the PBR events to pick their bull, mm -hmm. you know, he's going to pick— the biggest the and the baddest, bull. and he may have bucked off of that bull multiple times before, but in his words, nobody remembers 85-point bull rides, Shh. is what he said. That's fearless. And I like that. Yeah. We're working on putting it on a T-shirt. I do his merch for him. Okay. <laughs> it's great. <That's, laughs> Don't worry. It's coming soon. That's perfect. Put me on the but, list for that one when it comes out. But, you know, some guys at them them deals, when they have to pick, they're going to pick they, – they may not pick the biggest, baddest in the pen. They'll pick one that – they know they can ride. Yeah. And on the bareback side of that, the guy that resonates for that for me is Tim O'Connell. When you see Tim out there, it's the same thing. Second he gets off the bronc, looks straight up, kiss, walks off. Yeah. And he wins a lot. I, I I would say that was what, you know, one of the things that in my mind that attitude that aligned you and J B for me, you know, was his mindset towards you know, the ranker bulls and wanting them and accepting that sort of challenge. I mean, you could probably speak better. Well, no, I, w I was always better if, you know, I was, I was, I was better whenever I was getting on a bull that, that I wasn't sure or <clears throat> that nobody rode very often, you know, like the, like the, the, the more dangerous, you know, like, 018 Cowtown, great big brown, had huge horns and, and would hook every everybody that he could find. And so he everybody was really intimidated. And, you know, like even like J31 Bodacious, you know, I, was, I wasn't smart enough to be, to be afraid. I, I was pretty sure that, that I could ride him. 
and I was right one out of four times. <laughs> Didn't so. Bodacious have a thing too, to where like he got injured at one point, and then when he came back, he had a different bucking style. Yeah, he just kind of when he got, you know, fully matured, he got really, really big, and yeah, he kind of he would throw his head back and hit hit, hit people. Prior to that, he hit a lot of people, not when he came up to take a jump, but after he came down, coming up in the front. And then when he, his front feet came down, he would kick real high with his back feet. He would tend to jerk a lot of guys down because what happens, guys get to leaning back, trying to kind of get away from all the power that he is. And what you really have to do is the opposite and kind of stay forward and but once he started throwing his head back, if you're doing what you have to do to have a chance to ride him, and he'd knock, he'd knock you in the head, then that be that became a situation that there wasn't anything you could do because if you lean back to try to get away from that, he would hit you when he came down instead. Of, he's going to hit you either way. That's crazy. And uh, but that was. That was just probably in the last year that they bucked him. Yeah. Is there any bull nowadays that comes close to having like that type of repertoire as far as like if you're trying to do what you got to do to make the whistle, they're still going to find a way to hit you? Yeah, not 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 that, not that I know of. And if there is, they don't use them, and they they shouldn't. I mean, it's dangerous enough as it is. Right. You, you don't need to increase the the the, the danger because. As cool as bull riding is, the shit is real and the shit's dangerous. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, was there ever a time, you know, riding at, at some of, when you're trying to make the NFR and you're going to pro rodeos, you know, sometimes you'll find yourself at, at smaller rodeos, you know, um, as opposed to the PBR where a lot of their events right now are, you know, televised, what have you. But I guess what I'm thinking is like, did you ever find yourself getting on like a really high caliber bull that you knew was going to probably be at the NFR, but you were at like a really small town rodeo, something like a memorable type? I feel like that would probably be possible back then. It's like, oh, yeah. Well, I rode uh, 018 Cowtown in Lubbock, Texas. I won $1,004. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and right. yeah, I'm. That that happened lots of times. Yes, sir. I mean, I was ninety two one time at Loveland, Loveland, Colorado, where you won like nine hundred eighty bucks or something on yes, sir. On a you know an NFR bull that would have been in the in the in the in the rank pen. Yeah, I could see it happening today. Just as I mean, there's small rodeos today. I'm not saying there's not you know every rodeo today, but it seems like today with you know, everyone having a camera in their pocket, you know, it may be as though it's like you literally went 90 on a, on a bull in Loveland, Colorado, and, you know, six of your buddies know about it and that's about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. That was, yeah. You, yeah. Some of the, you know, some of the best rides that, you know, you might've ever made might've been at either a rodeo where there wasn't a lot of people or, I mean, I rode a bull of Don Kish's called Go Buckle, and he was like Red Rock's running mate, and he'd never been ridden. And it was in Reno, Nevada, at a pro tour rodeo, and there probably wasn't 500 people there. And it was one of the best rides I'd ever made at that time. He'd never been ridden. And, and uh, again, just one of those rides where it, it a stadium of people deserved to see it, but it's just, just. Right, I mean, in the, yeah. And no Instagram. And like, to Instagram like, like, like I said, he, I got Cowtown. You know, again, I rode him in Lubbock, but he drilled me at the NFR. <laughs> so <laughs> was, you saw uh, him back in the shoot. We were like, we meet again. Was that um, who owned Cowtown? Benny Butler. Benny. Mm -hmm. um, but he was scary because he was just so mean. <laughs> and really, there wasn't hardly any left-handed guys that could ever ride him. Being in Lubbock, did you go to a lot of Charlie Thompson stuff? I did growing up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did it, you go to Tech? I didn't. I went to Saul Ross. Did you have a family member go to Tech? Uh, I, 
I, my sisters went to Sister. Spectre. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's maybe that's what my my dad had said. Yeah. I think he was there the same time as your sister. Yeah. But anyway, that he ran around with the Charlie Thompson crew. Oh yeah, we used, growing up we used to go to all all those bull riding. I used to go get drilled frequently. Yeah. At his winter series. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. He said sometimes after. You know, it'd be a really good spot for people to go in the winter. Whenever. Well, he'd have, he'd have one big, big bull riding a year that that I would that, that paid a bunch for it. You'd get all the good guys, and they'd get 150, get 180 bull riders. God, crazy! There was that many bareback riders back then too, wasn't there? Yeah, now there's eight, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think it's 11. I think they they added a couple. But I, I, I will say, I'm the worst bareback rider I've ever seen. So. <laughs> I'm not far behind you. <laughs> I've never tried it, so I can imagine I'm the worst in this room right well, now. Well, the thing Don't. about bareback riding is Don't. even if you make a good ride, you're still going to get pummeled, you know. You still get beat up. It, you know, it's it's more physically demanding than any other, you know. If you ride Bronx, riding Bronx is just like taking an Uber to lunch. You know, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's once you, it's very challenging to get to where you can ride Bronx decent or good or even great but the learning curve of riding bronx you get annihilated repeatedly but once you figure it out it's pretty smooth pretty pretty smooth and stress-free unless you have one that you know either falls or flips over or something but that's riding. what you said right your first hundred bronx you're a one buck wonder right or a one hop wonder um no it was more like sometimes 200. two or three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, bronc riding's hard to learn. Hard to learn, yeah. But yeah. once you once you figure it out, it's yeah, it's pretty cool. But and then the bareback riding, you know, it's easier. It's probably the easiest to learn because you get so many second and third chances because mm-hmm. your hands welded in there. Mm-hmm. But if you've got a you know a good practice horse, you know, you just get so many chances to reposition, fix yourself, but and so I enjoyed like the hoppiest of hoppers that there that the that there were, but I did not enjoy the buckers. And that was when I realized that, that was when I knew I was done. You know. A bull or a bronc, I, I still enjoy, you know, the challenge of a good bronc ride or bull ride. And it gets me excited, you know, like I'm not I'm not saying there's not still the the knowledge of potential danger but i get excited at that but a bear but i get frightened really at a buck and a bucker and because your hand is just in there and it's if not you get hung up i mean i always said if i had to if i had to fight and a, a pick an event to choose somebody to fight you know bare knuckle bareback riding would be the last <laughs> event i chose <laughs> no even like i said you make a great ride and you still, it's 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 just a beating. It's just so physical. And you know, riding bulls, the actual riding, it's not not physical at all. No, it's you know, when you when you get off, you got to get off at some point in time. That's where one hundred percent of the injuries are in bull riding. It's never from the stress of riding, yeah. but Sometimes in bareback in bareback riding, it's all stress. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Sometimes in the shoot, most of the time after the ride. But yeah, bareback riding, it's in the shoot, on the horse, in the arena. Really, you're not safe till you get out of the arena in bareback riding. <laughs> right. No, that there's there's guys that do it and do it well, but it's a cowboy event for sure. Yeah. So it's one of my favorite parts of rodeo. I mean, it's the rough stock sports to me. It's poetry in motion. You just get to watch art for eight seconds, and best guy wins. Best guy walks out. How many years did you get on saddle bronc courses professionally? Oh, gosh, the first couple of years I made the finals, I entered bronc riding everywhere. You used to go to the circuit finals. And, you know, I, I rode, rode pretty good. You know, I think I won the college finals. I won, you know, I was a rookie in Texas. I won second, second or third in, in the circuit a couple of times. But. Again, when the when the real guys showed up, meaning you know the Up Bowers, you know Brad Germans and Bud Monroe, those kind of guys, they were just they were just a couple notches above me. I I couldn't turn my toes out 
good enough to to you know I wrote I wrote actually pretty pretty well and I liked it but I just wasn't as good as I wanted to be. Did you feel like having gotten on a bronc at the same rodeo it would help your bull riding? No, I don't think it really affected it much at all either way, but but I I, I really did like riding broncs. I just I wish I'd have been better, but I always you know find sometimes like if you're able to get on two you know like in the practice pen you get on one then your second one you're you know and i've i've it got expensive you know entering but i enjoyed you know multiple events and then your second one was but ultimately i didn't i didn't like going to i didn't i liked going to focus on one thing as well yeah i think that's after a couple of years of riding wrong i just realized that came the reality that which is hard to be honest with yourself is that you're not that good so yeah. <laughs> once I finally came to the realization I wasn't that good I'm like that was I'll just focus on what I what I have the best chance of being good at so well I'm glad you didn't tell yourself that about bull riding between the ages of four and eleven <laughs> yeah I was a yeah I was a, I was probably the worst for for, for a long time but like I said, I liked it whenever I was no good. And, and then whenever I got to where I could do it a little bit, I really liked it. That's Because winning, there's nothing, I don't care what it is, there's nothing cooler than winning. Winning, care about anything that's bothering you. Yeah. Just go win. <clears throat> go win. So that's. Yeah. That's the million dollar feeling, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, like I said, I, I, I liked doing it whenever I was terrible. So when you can win and you can keep from you can avoid the responsibility of getting a real job you ride bulls for a living yeah and you now you've transcended that on from riding bulls to when you were competing now to putting on bull riding events for the up-and-comers and all the kids that are trying to make finals and you know you i've been lucky enough to be to a couple of these but we're coming back to vegas next week i believe for the first time in a couple of years since you know all the pandemic and everything uh well yeah well we did it uh in 20 uh yeah that was the last one that i did was vegas yes sir so it's uh yeah it's pretty exciting it's it's it's, it's a cool place and you know after you know i'd ridden professionally for 10 years i I came to the realization again that I was probably going to have to get a real job, and that's when I started producing events and in the early '90s. And it's 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 fun, and you don't have to get near as scared, and you don't get beat up as much. So, but it's it, it's you know it's 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 like bull riding. You know, if you if you're going to be good at it and do good at it, you know, you got to you got to work hard at it, and you got to it's just it's just different in the preparation of it and, but it's it, you know, it beats a real job <laughs> yes sir whenever i wrap up my podcast i normally do life advice i don't know how you want to wrap up the i would like for both world. of you to give me life advice from what you know of me so far um well i'll tell you what donnie told me and that's if you're gonna be dumb you better be tough Agreed. I can roll with that. <laughs> I can roll with that. Well, that's what I think about, you know, for most of us rodeo cowboys. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to play this sport, you better be tough. No, I I, sh I heard on a podcast, a Joe Rogan podcast, it was um, a man has two lives and his second one starts when he realizes he only has one. Yes, sir. So that's what I've been telling myself lately. I always just go with take a chance Columbus did <laughs> <laughs> that is solid man I needed I needed to hear that today thank you yeah I'm gonna start making some more t-shirts too yeah coming up pretty quick well you're only we're only here once so yes sir let it roll don't leave you know don't, don't leave anything held back Yes, sir. Well, I, I just, like that. I just wanted to thank both of you once again for coming and hanging out with us for a little while on the first inaugural Rock and Roll Denim podcast. Um, you know, we'll definitely have you both back on 
very soon, I mean, you both have such a wealth of knowledge, not just into the rodeo lifestyle, but just life in itself. And I think for our audience that, you know, they're all rodeo fans and they're all cowboy. Most of them are cowboys, some of them are cowboys. But I think what you guys talk about and the way that you speak on the passions and the things that you love resonate with everybody that listens to it. So for me, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me for a little while. Well, thanks for putting me in the conversation with tough on all that that you just said <laughs> well, i had to have the two greatest bulls most of the bulls. time the long-haired hippie doesn't get thrown into that sentence but i appreciate <laughs> it well, i did have one more question this has been bothering me my second week at rock and roll denim i we we did a bunch of media we did I, we think nfr was coming up or something so we did a, a little shoot at billy bob's you and i and i think the next day we went to tuff's house and did some media out there there was a bull mounted on your wall what was the name of that bull? His name was, uh, he had a sponsor named Palace Station, but his original name was Whiplash. But yeah, he was a bull that I had drawn like six or seven times and was 88 to 90 every time, one first on him every time I had him. And he wasn't, you know, he was just a overachiever. He wasn't real big, strong. He's more of a longhorn. But uh, anyway, I'd, I loved him so. His owner, I told him, whenever he quit bucking him, he'd, he'd come live at my house. And so I'd put him out in my pasture and bought him a couple of girlfriends. And he hung out there. To, no, he was he was out there probably two or three years before he went to bull heaven. So he was a he he was pretty cool. He, Did you get some good calves out of him? Didn't ever get any calves out of him, Mm-mm. but he. Uh, Probably better for the legend. He but he he bucked off. Uh, I remember he bucked off Adrian Morris at Del Rio one time, and Adrian Morris was one best ever. You know, and dang. So he was a, yeah. He was he was, he was cool. So I just always wonder about that and your cowboy hats on the horn. Yeah, it was so great. Yeah. That's a cool mount. That's a cool mount. Yeah, for sure. Well, once again, thank you guys so much for coming to hang out with me. Uh, we'll have you back on very soon. I hope. Um, but you know. Let you wrap this one up since you are our inaugural first featured guest. On to the next one, old son. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thanks. Pow, pow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys again. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, that certainly was starting off with a bang. Like I said, I don't think we could have asked for two better first guests than Tuff and Dale. So thanks to those two for showing up and hanging out with us for a little while. And thank you guys for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube as well as whichever streaming app you prefer. We should be just about everywhere by now. And as I said at the top, be sure to check out our Vintage 46 collection available at rockandrolldenim.com. And for the very first time, I'm proud to announce the launch of our newest collection. It's a collaboration like no other featuring two of the most badass brands in the Western apparel industry. Who Huey and Rock and Roll Denim. That's right, this fall we will be launching Huey Denim online as well as at your favorite Western retailer. So be sure to stay tuned for more on that. Once again, thanks for rocking with us here on Talk and Shoot. We have so much more for you on the way featuring some really exciting guests. But until then, y'all take care and keep it flexy.